The Douglas Coleman Show is made possible with support from Seth David Radwell, a recent guest on the program and author of American Schism, How the Two Enlightenments Hold the Secret to Healing Our Nation, released this past July. As Publishers Weekly writes in its recent glowing book life review of American Schism, business executive Radwell's epic debut examines the historical influences that have led to what he sees as the collapse of politics in the United States. Seth Radwell makes the case that the current chasm between the American right and left can be traced back to the 18th century's Age of Enlightenment and the basic tenets of liberty, equality, and reason. American Schism provides a historical perspective that can help us fight today's unreason with reason and bridge current-day divides. American Schism by Seth David Radwell is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and wherever books are sold. For more information, go to americanschismbook.com It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Jay Stewart Dixon. Hello, Jay Stewart. How are you? Hey, Douglas. Uh, I'm, re- I'm doing really good. It's uh, great to be here. Thank you for having me on your show. Well, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. I got a real kick out of your book title, Spirituality for Badasses. And <laughs> I, my yep. producer and I both had a laugh on that. I, we thought it was great. I was going to say, good. Then, then I've done my job with, uh, with uh, creating a good title. I'm a little bit confused exactly about the book. The book is a sure. guide to spirituality, but it's done in a, a more unconventional way, I suppose, for lack of a better way to put it. Yeah, it's in a genre. There's a genre of self-help books. It's called Irreverent Self-Help. There are quite a few books in, in this genre, and mine is one of them. Um, a, a couple of famous ones. Uh, probably the most famous one is is called uh, by Mark Moran. It's called the Subtle Art of Not Giving a F U C. Do I need to spell it? <laughs> um, it's a Sorry. yeah. Th- there's a, there's a number of books that have decided to bypass the conventional feel good woo woo uh, mushy vernacular and go for the jugular. And it took me a while to figure out that that was my style as well. And uh, there's quite a big audience for it because not everybody wants to read a dry and serious self-help book that uh, is uh, boring and filled with New Age pithy sayings. Well, it's true. And, you know, there's so much variety as to where somebody might want to go when they feel a little bit lost and they feel depressed and stressed and they're looking for some kind of spiritual guidance I mean, traditionally, people went with the Bible if they were Christian. Um, True that. And, you know, there's other religious practices and beliefs around the world. And then New Age came out. I I would say probably in the 60s it really became more popular. But a lot of it, like you said, is kind of mushy and, uh, you know, meditate and uh, people don't have time for it. There's another book out, a friend of mine, he wrote called Anti-Self-Help, which is, I think, <laughs> similar to this genre. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly what genre yeah. his book is in, but it's very funny. And it's yeah. it's really all about sort of, sort of these people pretending to be gurus while taking your money, you know, for their yeah, right. $3,000 a month meditation on the beach class. So yeah. he kind of dispels all of them. But give me a little bit of the backstory, your backstory, and how you got to the point to write this book. Because I noticed the book release date was January of this year. Uh, so this Correct. was a book born out of COVID? Yeah, I wrote it during COVID. Yes, I did. Okay. Absolutely. It, yeah. Was it a COVID-inspired yeah, book, or did you have this idea already to do it? I already had the idea. I, I had been involved in spirituality and writing for decades before COVID came along. The My backstory and my background is fairly straightforward, fairly simple. When I was in my 
early 20s, I suffered from depression. And the, it started in college, really, where I just didn't feel like I belonged. I didn't feel like I fit in. Uh, I, I felt like I was born on the wrong planet. I was unhappy. I was miserable. The depression started out as a slow background uh, squeak and turned into a full-on uh, cacophony by the time I was in my mid-20s. And so I, 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 so I wasn't really I was stuck between a rock and a, and a hard place. I, I, I didn't really care for conventional therapy. I tried Prozac, and that made me feel like shit. Um, and so I, I was like, okay, I'm going to... I'm going to try these things in spirituality, see if there's anything to it. If not, then I'll go some other route. So I did, and, and I gave it a try for a few years. And lo and behold, I got some results. I, I had some epiphanies. I had some insights that I really liked and really that I benefited from. So I kind of went into, Douglas, I went into spirituality sort of kicking and screaming. Um, but slowly, I, I got my sea legs and, and became adjusted to it. I I, I didn't get. I, I think part of the reason that I wrote why I'm interested in irreverent self-help is I didn't get involved in spirituality to become a, a teacher or a, or a guru or a saint. I just got involved because I felt like crap, and I wanted a solution to that. So when I, you know, I'd been I'd been in it for many many years, and um, that solution did come, you know, a good decade or so into it. My depression went away and has not returned since. So I'm left on the other side of that. I, I want to pass this stuff on. I'm a very creative individual. I like writing. And how can I do this that's true to to who I am, that's authentic? And I found that humor, a few potty mouth words, a little bit of irreverence, and and really going for the jugular in terms of, calling it like it is, was my cup of tea. And uh, so COVID, yes. So COVID it has been really good for self-help authors. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, you know, I mean, what a horrible couple of years we've, we've had. And, uh, yeah. every, you know, a lot of people are have suffering on top of their suffering. I mean, it's just horrible. And so I, I, I did indeed, I began writing the book in early 2020, right after COVID started. And that was just sort of coincidence, really. <clears throat> um, and I started sending out chapters free to, to my email list to some, some, uh, some fans that I had already had. And they liked it, and I continued, and they liked it more, and it just snowballed. And I was like, oh, okay, well, this works. And, and of course, because of COVID, there were a lot of people looking for alternative solutions to what the hell was going on is there a silver lining to this crap? And so I was offering them a silver lining. I was like, yeah, there is a silver lining to this. If you can, you know, if, you, if you're up for the challenge, if you've got the courage. So that's, I wrote it during COVID. And then I, and then I yes, indeed, I, uh, I released it in January of this year. And it's really taken off. Okay. Well, aside from spirituality books, COVID has been fantastic for everybody who's been writing books or who has been meaning to write a book for the last 15 years, and they finally got the time when a lot of people yeah. were in lockdown. I mean, we have been busier than ever with people that have mm -hmm. just published their book, which is great. I'm not complaining. Yeah. It's been great for my business. So I'm happy to hear yeah. that. The one thing I'm curious about, though, is you're talking about the sort of the nuts and bolts of spirituality, for lack of a better term. Yes. And can yeah. you give me an example of one thing that happened to you where it kind of turned you around? You know, the epiphany moment, the aha moment. What was it oh, exactly yeah. that you first, because there had to be one, and then that sort of opens yeah. the door, right, to get you in there and say, oh, yeah, okay, let's, let's keep going. So what was the first yeah. one? Sure. So epiphanies come in two forms or qualities. There's a positive epiphany, and then there's, a negative epiphany. Both of them are good, but they have different tones. The first epiphany that I had was a positive one, and it was an out-of-body experience. When I was in my college years and trying things and seeing if there is something to this whole spiritual stuff, I became interested in, in, in uh, 
binaural V technology, meditation through hemi-sync technology, and, and there's a famous book called Journeys Out of the Body by Robert Monroe. I read his book. It was, I thought, that's really cool. Okay, if I can do that, if I can do that crap, and have some sort of weird out-of-body <laughs> experience that proves that there's more than just this meat body than the, than the physical body, then I'm on board. And, and that actually happened. I had, a, I had a number of repeated, really wild out-of-body experiences through meditation that, that told me, okay, there is something to this. Wow. And, again, that was, that was very positive, and that's kind of what got me into spirituality. But then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast forward to another critical point, which is more of a, a negative type of epiphany. And this comes with... Uh, maturity on the spiritual path, where you realize that that climbing up the outside of the mountain, going after puppy dogs and ice cream cones and all the feel good stuff, just isn't working out. Like that stuff's not actually doing it. It wasn't getting rid. In other words, having an out of body ex- experience or having a, a a positive insight didn't cure my depression. It, it didn't cure the sense of being separate. So the other the other insight that I had was this. Is on, on the darker side, on the shadow side, was this absolute fear. I ran into this wall of absolute and complete fear of death and annihilation. And it just rattled me to no end. But I had read enough about what that meant, that that was actually a good thing. Because what's happening there is your ego, the mind, is recoiling in the face of it becoming second um, in, in, in command, essentially. So there's a deconstruction part of this spiritual process that takes place that is heralded by these deep feelings of, of fear, these deep feelings of, of, of depression, these deep feelings of, of anxiety. And boy, did I experience those. So those two epiphanies, one positive, very positive, and one on the negative side that scared the hell out of me um, were the things that said, okay, I'm on the right path, this is, this is the way to healing, and um, that's, that's, how it, that's how it happened. And, and there's a little bit of both in, in the book. Okay. I'm curious about something. Did you try psychotherapy before you got into the spirituality realm? More like during. during. I didn't try conventional psychotherapy until I'd been involved with spirituality a little bit. And I went to a few times to a, to a fellow local. Um, it was okay. I, I, think, I think what I discovered with conventional psychotherapy was like, it, it, it felt like it was addressing parts and pieces, but not the, not the whole person, not the whole being. Because um, once I discovered that there is more to me than what appears on the surface, then I felt like, okay, there's, there's a deeper layer here. And I actually got more psychotherapeutic advice from the spiritual teachers that I hung out with than I did from um, this particular psychotherapist. Maybe I had a bad therapist, who knows, or I just didn't give it a try. But I think the bottom line is I was, I was fulfilled in the therapy area from the Zen teachers that I was hanging out with, from the from the non-dual um, Buddhist teachers I was hanging out with. Well, you brought up a good point, and this was one of the reasons why I asked that question, is because I have interviewed other people who have gone through extensive psychotherapy, and they said mm. kind of the same thing, that psychotherapy only addresses the surface issues. You know, they talk about your childhood, they talk about your mother, they talk about what's yeah. going on in the physical world, you know, in, in your life right yeah. now. And what happened in your past, uh, you know, if you were abused as a child, yeah. if uh, all these different things, right, that are going to culminate into what you have become as an adult. And it doesn't necessarily yeah. jive because people that I've known that have suffered from severe depression grew up as like normal, yeah. regular kids. They weren't abused, you know, they weren't, they had loving yeah. parents and they, everything was fine. They lived in a comfortable suburban house and went to school and they were suicidal for many years so it it's, i was in that camp yeah, yeah. okay so 
yeah with with the spirituality though it it kind of gets to the it cuts to the core right yeah we're talking about we're talking about the difference between the, and there's nothing wrong with conventional therapy don't you know don't don't misconstrue what i'm saying about it i think it's, it can be very beautiful for for a lot a lot of people that's that's absolutely true but then there's then there is there's a point if you if you do get involved in spirituality where what happens is that you see that the depression that you're suffering has a deeper more existential root right and yeah. the only thing that can that that i found that was able to heal and cure the the existential deep deep part was spirituality was involved was involving myself with teachers who had who themselves had gone to that existential place had gone to that deep shadowy place met the dragon conquered the dragon and then moved on and then they were able to convey to me here's how you do it here's the process here's the meat and here's the nuts and bolts of it and hearing that kind of thing was like oh yes yes how do i you know i was fully open to that because i just had this hunch i just had this deep set feeling in my bones that this was existential in nature and not because me too i had great parents i had a great childhood i i I have no reason in the world to be depressed and yet i got to college and i'm like what the f-u-c-k is going on why do i feel this way and it just continued and continued and so fortunately and with gratitude i was able to orient my depression in a way to see it not as some sort of fundamental horrible character flaw but quite the opposite to see my depression to see existential depression as an invitation from evolution to evolve to get the hell out of the box that you're in to expand to grow to find that part of you that is actually quite okay so what do you do now to keep in touch with the spiritual side of life I get asked that question quite a bit. My go-to answer is I, I spend a lot of time in nature. I like to fly fish. I like hiking. I like to be outdoors quite a bit. Okay. I don't. That that's my, that's my go-to zone. I don't practice yoga or meditate three hours in the morning, which is probably what a lot of people expect me to say. Because in my case, I went after the medicine. I took the medicine, and the medicine cured me. So why would I continue taking the pills or the medicine? I really don't. I, I've, I feel like basically I got in a touch with a part of myself, the spiritual badass. I got in touch with it. I met it and completely embraced it, and it never went away since I did that. So it's not like it's, you know, I don't, it's, I'm not, I don't want to pay, paint a, too much of a grandiose picture here. It's just basically about awareness and discovering that who you really are is deeper and more profound than your exterior outer uh, personality. Well, I agree with you. And I've always felt sort of, uh, I don't know, questioning. I don't have one particular spiritual or religious conviction. Uh, I look mm. at them all and I keep an open mind. You know, I'm a relatively yeah. happy person. I don't think I suffer from severe depression. I get upset yeah. like anyone else. But uh, sure. generally, I'm in a good good place mentally. But the one thing that I always find interesting as a question to constantly ask myself is when you talked about the physical world and you look around and you see the political bullshit that's going on in this country and people suffering in the world and and you say, well, it's got to be better than this. There's got to be more to it than this. So that's the sort of drive that keeps me going is constantly looking for, you know, something else. Now I haven't quite found it yet. Maybe I'll read your book, but, uh, you know, but it's not, it's not something that I, I need to find, which it sounded like in your case, you know, but I definitely want to find. I I do think the majority of individuals that I helped and the majority of other peers, authors, teachers like myself, 
really did run into that wall, Douglas, the, the, the wall of I've got to do this uh, or I will just go insane. I've, I have got to risk everything or, and heal myself before I can be okay in this world and even consider the possibility of healing or fixing the, you know, whatever else needs to be fixed in this world. Um, that's how I sort of felt about it was like, until I can get straight in on the, on my own inside, there ain't, I have no, I have no use to anybody, including my family, um, my wife, my kid and my friends and those who I help professionally. Right. You're correct. I agree with you too. Yeah, I mean, you do have to get yourself straight before you're going to be of any use to anybody else. That's I know that. And it took yeah. me a while. I almost lost my wife uh, in a nasty mm. divorce, but then we got it back together. And I realized that it was me. Mm. You know, as she was doing everything she could, and it just was I was so consumed with myself that I was, mm. like, totally ignoring her. But... That's a story for another show. Uh, we do have to wind this down. Do you have a website that you want to give out for your book or personal website? People come check you out. Sure. It's the name of the book, Spirituality for, dot, uh, for Badasses.com. Okay, great. Now, the book's been out just about a year. I see that it's won some awards. Uh, it's doing pretty well, yeah? Yeah. Um, I've, for, I'm self-published, and um, I now am making a, a living off of doing this full time which is really really oh, awesome. Oh, that's great. That's and great. it's won yeah, it's won some awards. Uh it's been a number one bestseller on Amazon in about nine categories. It kind of pops in and out of that of that uh number one status from, you know, depending on the day. So yeah, it's been really really <laughs> awesome. I, I mean I mean from a listener point of view, it's like really who cares how many books it's sold or whatnot. The bottom line is is that it's helping people and they're telling their friends that, wow, that this really, I get emails and uh, comments and uh, whatnot, uh, um, you know, almost daily about, thank you, this really, really helped me to get through this tough time, or this changed my life, things like that. So when you, <laughs> I knew it was working when I started getting comments like that, I was like, okay, cool, that is, that is really good stuff right there, and I'm, I'm very um, honored and humbled, and really, it's really awesome that that's happening. Well, super. I'm glad to hear it. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was nice meeting you, and uh, I think I may check out the book. It sounds sounds like well, thank you, Douglas. Something I, I would it. be interested in. All right, take care. Best of luck. Adios. You're listening to Mister Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Douglas Coleman's Don't Do a Podcast is a dryly humorous rant about Douglas's pet peeve, the unrelenting torrent of podcasts hitting the web on a constant basis. As technology has put podcasting within the reach of anyone, many wholly unqualified people have taken the plunge. This witty polemic tries to persuade them from broadcasting their drivel using Douglas's brand of sarcastic humor. Now on Amazon, only 99 cents. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com
Radio promotion for indie musicians. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers. Don't touch anything. You've got it right where you need it. Tuned in to the Douglas Coleman Show. You heard me. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Paul Donsbach. Hey, Paul, how are you? Doing good. Thank you, Douglas. I uh, appreciate uh, being on the show. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for coming on. So you've got a book out called Knights of the Lost Temple. Actually, it says book one, the Bronze Scroll. So how many books are there in this series? I have a co-author, and we're planning a seven-book series. Uh, we've uh, released book one, and we're currently working on book two. Oh, I see. Okay. But you're planning for seven books? Yes, we've got the the seven books pretty well sketched out, uh, and uh, we hope to release a new book every six or nine months or so. Okay, let me ask you about that process, because I've never written more than one little book. So when you you decide, okay, I'm going to do seven books, how do you determine that it's going to take seven books to tell all these stories? That's a good question. The um, the series is about the different spiritual traditions in the world, the the main ones, and so we we spent time figuring out how how many we thought that we wanted to explore, and so we came up with seven, uh, which has some some historical resonance. It's often viewed as an important number, and um, then we sort of mirrored that with the plot that we we laid out, and it and it all uh, came together pretty seamlessly. Okay. I got to ask this question because the, for the last two days, I've done nothing but interview people who have some connection book wise or TED talk wise with spirituality in one form or another. And do you think COVID has inspired all of this with people? Because we're just getting inundated <laughs> with this particular subject matter. I absolutely do, and this is I'm, I'm having a lot of conversations with people about this, and, and it seems to be a spontaneous uh, activity. Uh, a lot of people are looking at this. In fact, I don't know anyone who isn't. Um, and I think there's this this experience all of us went through, I think really brought it brought people together and, and that we're understanding better how to connect with each other because we weren't for a while for our own for our own health reasons. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, if there is a silver lining to be had with this misery that we've all endured for the last 18 months or so, I hope it is that. I I genuinely hope it is. I'm not seeing any real results yet. It may take a little while, yeah? I certainly am not seeing anything from the government side, uh, but I kind of don't put spirituality and government in the same box <laughs> because I think they're they're disconnected. So, sometimes our institutions are the last to get the memo when when something's going on in the world. That it, 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 it does seem to me and everyone I talk to is that there 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 is some movement, and I think people are um, exploring that side of themselves and their relationships, and that's what we in particular we wanted to write about is that that interesting dynamic between your relationships and um, what we call the divine. And, and if, is that a relationship itself? And I think most people feel that, that it is. Okay, so your book series is not necessarily preaching any particular road to spiritual enlightenment, right? Or is it? No, not at all. It's it's an exploration, and we um, we actually started out with extremely modest ambitions. Um, our first book we based it on an unsolvable mystery because we viewed that as a metaphor for our times. Uh, it seems like all the big discoveries are past us: the North Pole, the Moon, and in our modern world, it seemed like we all had to just be realistic about what we can know and what we can achieve. And there's so much we don't know, especially about spirituality. I think most of us feel that way. Um, and it turned out, though, that our characters uh, were a little ahead of us, and they, they solved that mystery, we think. Um, it, and so we are now a little more optimistic about what we can do when we're writing through our characters. It says, based on a true story. Can You want to give us a little quick uh, blip on the true story, what, what it was? Absolutely. There's uh, a Dead Sea Scroll known as the Copper Scroll, and it's a 
quite mysterious because although the other scrolls are all made of papyrus or, or leather, uh, this one's actually made out of bronze. And the reason they call it the copper scroll is they, they took a while to get it tested. And at first they thought it was copper. And bronze is, is just copper with a little bit of tin added. Um, and it's a it's surprisingly, it is a treasure map. Um, and, but no archaeologist, historian, or, any, or treasure hunter has been able to figure out where what the treasure clues are and so that's what we based it on thinking this this was an impossible mystery and um to our surprise the characters started figuring it out just for people that don't know what exactly are the dead sea scrolls good question so it's it's about 1100 scrolls of different types that were found in caves i think it's 11 caves near the dead sea and the dead sea is that borders israel and jordan and very low elevation, I think it's actually the lowest land surface on the planet, and very dry, very hot. So with those conditions, these scrolls didn't deteriorate for the most part. So this is um, considered the, the most reliable, the most authentic source for much of what we know about the ancient world, because most things just got copied over and over by scribes, sometimes being changed, and you don't know what could have been changed. So these are 2,000-year-old, sometimes older, um, histories uh, of things that we can learn about the ancient world. Okay, and there were references to Jesus in these scrolls? From what I understand, there are not any direct references to Jesus, although they are, some of them were created and saved at the time that Jesus lived. Um, the scrolls were kept by a group, a religious group known as the Essenes, and some scholars think that Jesus may have been an, an Essene, and some, some people disagree, earlier before his ministry. So there's, there's a lot of lively discussion about whether Christianity um, you know, had direct relationships with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Oh, I see. Okay. Had you written before? I mean, is that what you do for a living, or did this come about uh, <laughs> a baby born of COVID, I should say? It absolutely is a baby born of COVID, okay. and, and uh, like most people, I put some thought into you know what I'd like to do with the extra time I suddenly had on my hands. And um, I was in a writer's workshop at the time doing remotely and met uh, my co-author, Elias Sina, and she was working on her own novel as I was just starting mine. And we decided to uh, team up and, and write a, a, an adventure romance novel together. Um, so that's how that came out. Was there any personal, personal epiphany to write something like this, you know, in the sense of spirituality, or was there anything that happened to you personally that sort of inspired you to want to make a story like this? Lots of them, and and one of them that I think for me relates to spirituality in my my um, search or, or journey for that is uh, when I was young, I was 13 years old, uh, my sister, who was a year older than me, um, had an illness, it was leukemia, and she, she died when I was 13, she was 14, we were very close. Um, and in the hospital, the, the, you know, that last day, uh, people were hugging, and there was a nurse came over and just comforted me, and um, I think that sense of connection that you can have, and it, to me, it was just... Um, from a, that kindness that people have, you understand that everything's okay. And I could sense my sister going to a place of pure love. So I, I think, and, and talking with other people, I, everyone I've ever talked to about this sort of thing has had a similar experience where they just know um, that we're not alone and, and there is this spiritual presence uh, that's here and, and everywhere. Um, so, but we all have, learn different traditions around that. And one of the things that, that we want to explore in this series is what are those traditions and what are the common threads that weave through them? And maybe we can all, uh, at least for ourselves as authors, understand some of that a little better. Do you think technological advances have hurt people's ability to connect with their spiritual self? And I don't just mean the internet now, but I mean throughout history, throughout time. Because it seems like every time we've taken a leap there's been a, a decline in people's beliefs in spirituality because it tends, science tends to contradict it in a funny sort of way. It's 
so interesting when you look at history because every time a new tool is developed, absolutely, it's a dis- it's a it, it's a distraction. It's um, something that changes us and takes us further away from some of those ancient roots that that were so spiritual. And when you look at the ancient world, it was something that they lived with and thought of as just part of their everyday life. And what <clears throat> many people teach and I believe a, a lot in this, is that the conscious mind is a wonderful tool itself, but it it um, can get in the way of experiencing um, the spiritual side. And, and so that's what meditation uh, is mostly about, is calming the, the conscious mind so that we can access something that's probably more important. What do you think is the major reason why people have migrated to spirituality versus staying to with a traditional religion i mean not all people but there have been a lot of people who have shifted in fact i see that on your bio where it says spiritual but not religious yes and i think that uh, the the people who track this say that's the largest growing faith group if you will in, yeah. in, in the world and certainly in the west and i think that it's consistent from what I understand, with our own traditions. And, and all of the religions got started as a personal journey. And because it's an institution, um, in order for it to function, it, it gets a little um, layered. And sometimes those layers, even though they're important and they provide continuity, feel like they get in the way with that direct personal experience with what we consider the divine. So I think everyone um, is looking for that personal experience, and I know I am, and um, writing about it has, for us as authors, been uh, a great experience. We, we feel like we are making progress as, as human beings. Well, I can remember as a little kid being taken to church by my grandfather, who went every Sunday, and I don't remember feeling any sense of spirituality in the church. It was really more like a social club. They'd get together on Sunday. People would get up and sing. There would be a sermon. And then after it was done, everybody would go eat a big dinner, well, two o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> At, you know, in the in the function hall kind of thing. And it would be like potluck. Everybody brought something. And everybody would sit around and eat, and then they'd go home. I didn't feel a real sense. Uh, I felt community, but I didn't feel spiritual in any way. So that never really thrilled me. When I read the Book of Buddha years ago on an airplane flight back from Thailand, when I had uh, like you know twelve hours to sit there, I read the book, and that one was much more interesting to me because, like you said, it addressed spirituality from the perspective of the individual rather than the collective. And that I like. To me, the world heritage of, of spiritual thinking is such a gift. There's so much out there. You could never read or, or learn about all of this in a lifetime. And so many of these traditions offer different lenses or ways of, of thinking about and accessing these things. And that that's what why we wanted to write a seven-book series to... to go through as much of them as we can. It, there's a, I think, a kind of three-dimensionality and a depth that's available to all of us by by going through these things. And, and sometimes if you mix and match a little bit, you come up with some surprising things. Yeah, that's a good point. Because they do overlap. If you take the major religions, there are a lot of parallels in what they're saying. They may be saying it in different ways using different parables and different examples. But yes, they do overlap. And I think it's wise for people to explore all of them rather than just sort of blindly follow one. Would you agree? Absolutely. And the scholars and historians who are digging further into our past are coming up with some really interesting and surprising discoveries. Um, so reading about this is is quite enlightening. Um the, the ancient world was much more diverse than I think has commonly been understood, and there were Buddhists in the Middle East, in the Levant, when, when Jesus was living, and there are scholars who wonder whether some of those ideas didn't 
migrate into some of our other traditions. And so you can look at all of the major religions and see threads that are in common, and it's an interesting exploration to see where they came from. Yeah, definitely. So as you mentioned, your book is your book series is going to be seven books. The first book has now been released. Yes, that's right. That's the Bronze Scroll, okay. and that's uh, we have a, a an adventure story about our characters. Our, our our protagonist, Sam Romero, is an attorney. He investigates corporate whistleblowing claims, um, and that brings him into some adventures and this this mystery. And he learned about the Bronze Scroll, or commonly called the Copper Scroll, and they get involved in. Um, some corporate malfeasance as to that, and and uh, the adventures really take off. Is this going to be like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark <laughs> in terms of a <laughs> film comparison? That's one of my favorite movies, as it is Aaliyah's, and so we, we, we do uh, write very self-consciously about th there being such a wonderful story, and um, there is uh, probably some overlap between um, treasure hunting and learning about ancient mysteries. And um, since you mention it, one of the things that our characters think they found on this Copper Scroll is uh, a, a reference to the legend of the Lost Ark, and that this may have been... Uh, created by the Jewish, uh, sorry, the Jerusalem Temple um, in the first century as as a record, uh, because at the time this artifact was made, they were at war with the Romans, and it, it may be that they wanted to preserve their information about where the Lost Ark was in, in a Dead Sea cave. Well, Paul, we do have to wind this down. So you said book one is out. Uh, when can we expect book two? Um, we're planning it to be released in late summer or early fall of next year, 2022. Uh, and the title of this is The Last Pharaoh. So it's set in Egypt and Greece um, and involves a, a little bit of uh, the, the stories about Cleopatra and, and um, uh, some of the uh, Roman emperors that were involved at the time. Uh, do you have a website that you want to give out for the book? Yes, please. It's knightsofthelosttemple.com. Um, and our book is available uh, for sale in, in retail stores on Amazon and Google Books and other, other locations. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was nice meeting you, nice chatting with you, and uh, best of luck with the series. Seven, uh, you plan on doing, what, two a year? Releasing two a year? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. about one every six months or so. That's, that's a good um, timeline. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, that works. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Douglas, for having me on the show. I really, really enjoyed it.